we've talked about in the fact how you guys are inhabiting whatever character you're actually playing at the time. So in a way, it's like you're just switching into another body, into another person. Is there anything different, do you think, when you are preparing to switch from one romantic pairing to another that's very different? Hey guys, it's Wraith here. Every week, I get together with the Everdark cast and we talk about things related to vampires, voice acting, and life. Sometimes I ask them questions, but sometimes they ask me questions. And by the way, we want to hear your answers to those same questions in the comments. Uh, even though they have, you know, we've talked about the similarities between even Balthazar and, and Damon, Damon and Julian and Christian and Julian. Is it different to switch out? Is there any different sense you feel when you're like acting these scenes? I know this is a really hard one, especially we've talked a lot about this stuff, but I'm looking at this question. I'm going, hmm, we've answered this, but. Well, I, I mean, technically readers, uh, listeners rather may not know that I I'm recording my, the both characters, uh, Julian and Christian separately, mostly to keep them straight in my own mind <laughs> and to make sure that there is some kind of continuity with the voices there. So we will spend an entire recording session or two or three just on one character so that I am not having to just constantly switch between the two. And, and like, technically, doing a scene like this, like, I, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before about portraying kind of the intimacy of some of these scenes, making it seem like we're in the same room as one another when we're recording these, in fact, maybe weeks apart sometimes. It's kind of the thing I find exciting about the audio medium is that you're unlike uh, theater, for example, which I, I believe most of our backgrounds come from theater, um, you get to play these intimate scenes uh, to an audience that is your microphone, right? An audience of one that can be as close as you want them to be. So there's a way to achieve that kind of intimacy and that kind of closeness that's pretty unique to the audio medium, I think. I mean, I mean, film and television can do it to some extent, but I do think there's something really kind of like uh, immediate about, uh, about this art form. I don't know if I, uh, that's, that's kind of a separate question. <laughs> it's not quite what you asked me, but <laughs> uh, I, you know, it, it is it is a fascinating thing because I never knew that when things were recorded like this for you know whether it would be an anime or you know a voice play or whatever that you guys weren't together. I was like, well, it, it, it honestly, uh, Catherine, it depends on um, the kind of like I've done animation where there's a few studios in town that can have. 14 or 15 actors in the same room all recording at the same time, which is awesome if you get the opportunity to do that, but it doesn't lend itself well to audiobooks because there's going to be one person doing all that narration and then you're paying performers to stay and listen to that other performer perform. <laughs> stand around. Yeah. 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 So it doesn't really like, it doesn't really work. And again, it depends on the budget. If you're doing something for Disney or Netflix, you know, you can spend $2,000 a day on a, on a studio and pay 14 or 15 actors to sit around and work. Whereas, you know, audiobooks are a different budget altogether. It also tends to be on, on certain projects that might be wanting the actors to improvise or, or, or necessitate the vibe of six comedic actors in a room feeding off each other. A show, I'm trying to think of like, like Bob's Burgers. I know they do certain scenes in that where they are in the same room because they want them to, as comedians mostly, heighten the script, right? <laughs> Something like this, where the wording I think is very precise, it's very descriptive in itself. We already have the words for us. It makes it easier to be able to do that, right? It is a challenge as an actor though, to, to do a, a scene that is dialogue heavy without even hearing the other actor's lines kind of add intensity to a scene, a scene that shifts where an argument starts, say, and resolves itself to kind of find the right pitch. But that's where, I mean, it's good having a director in the room. It's good having somebody who can kind of uh, course correct and make sure that when it's all edited together, it sounds cohesive. That definitely makes sense. I think about actually the legend of Mox, of, of Vox Machina, you know, that went from being critical roles Basically, they're Dungeons and Dragons fun time. And now it's there's an anime on it, which is quite good, or an animation of it, which is a lot of fun. But I imagined I could sort of pick out what must have been, you know, the, you know, basically the synergy between the actors and how different it was when it was, you know, scripted and how that was different. But I have to say that they, 
it created something that was a lot of fun, but I could tell that would be so different. So I wonder if people who had viewed the actors all together, hearing all of that as they played off of one another and then went to a scripted thing, it was like, wait, it's not the same at all. But yeah, that does make a, a lot of sense to me. As an avid critical role viewer and watcher and listener, um, there is that element of like, oh, it's not what it was. It's not what it was, but that was five years ago and this is now. Mm. And you kind of got to be like, this is a brand new thing. This is a, this, this audio book is completely different to reading the books. It's a whole new experience. And I think a lot of people get that anyway. They can spoon, spoon it up and be like, this is just a different flavor. Like Harry, Harry, the Harry Potter book, we're allowed to talk about those. Harry Potter books versus the movies, both are yeah. brilliant in uh, in their own way. But there's people that are that are um, staunch purists to this and that. And, you know, if you're that close-minded about it, then it's not for you. And dear listener, um, you know, if you want uh, Wraith to write a radio play, like an audio play version, where there's, oh, I read the narrator as well. So I actually have the, a lot more of information there to me. I can actually describe things and write things and let that affect me and then go back and do the character's voice. So I actually have an advantage there, I think. But audio plays are different again. If you hear um, the classic radio plays, there's very little description. It's literally you have someone running a, a sound deck or doing even live sound, if you can imagine that. Um, and it's all about performance in the moment with people in the same room. And that's a different beast again. Um, but I'm shooting a movie at the moment and I had to shoot a scene last week with uh, my leading, my the leading lady is my love interest. I've never met her yet. I haven't met her. Wow. And it was playing a scene where we had to have a relationship because this scene is from the middle of the movie. So this is the part of the challenge of the actor to bring that to the work. And that's where training and experience and skill helps. Yeah. So it's, they're all different. I've done video games, cartoons or anime. Honestly, they're more concerned about matching the lip flap, which is the movement of the character's mouth, than they are about your performance. And someone's going first. <laughs> so, you know, when you're doing a German thing and you come in or a Japanese thing and you're trying to match English to a lip flap that was created for non-English, that's a whole other thing as well. So actually, I'm going to say the writer and the editor get most of the kudos for this. And for me, in terms of just to answer the question about playing a scene like you're a few inches apart, Adam, do you want to do you want to show them the proximity effect with a microphone? How that works? That's secret. I I mean, like just literally getting closer to it. Yeah. So Adam, so I, <laughs> yeah. so so we're, I'm sitting back off my mic. Adam, I can see there is off his. And if we start to move in closer and speak quietly, you can see how as I get closer to the microphone. So I'm I'm ooh, right up against the pop guard, <laughs> and it feels like I'm just against your ear that I'm very, very close to the listener, which can be way too close. Slower, please, Edward. Slower, please. Sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah, that <laughs> could be saying. way too close uh, in, for narration. You have a voice that lends itself to that, too. Yeah. Well, think of, I think, is it called ASMR? Or is that a, mm -hmm. what it's called? And yes. so in, in sort of technical things, just for those of you who are wanting to do this sort of thing at home, if you work closer to the microphone, as you get closer, you hear me getting closer and closer, it feels like I'm whispering in your ear. So if I want to play that I'm the pillow, if I'm on the pillow next to you, then that's how I, I work. And it drives the editor nuts. In fact, I may have got a, a note today to not do that as much. Just saying. He did. He got a note today from the editor being like, uh, you guys sound great, but can Edward lay off the mic a little bit? No, no, never. Yeah. My style is eternal. <laughs> I hoped you liked this behind-the-scenes discussion with the cast and crew of the Everdark podcast. If you want to join the conversation, come to YouTube and tell us what you think in the comments. And just so you know, I'm not the only one reading the comments. The entire cast is too, and they're very eager and excited to hear from you. If you are already listening on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe to get notified when the next episode of Everdark comes out.